Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, and Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> I know that a lot of you have probably eaten way too much food in this side of the world and are now feeling full, but thank you for joining us and coming back tonight and being part of our last message when it comes to the Luke's, the rest of the story. Because we've been looking at tonight's our eighth night in our Christmas week of messages where we've been talking, as we said, concerning Luke and the rest of the story. And there was so many people that have been involved in talking and surrounding the baby Jesus through his birth and then over the next few days after that and even into the later years of his childhood. And we're grateful that you have joined us tonight and we pray that you've had a great Christmas day. And hopefully, even though you've not been able to get out amongst people very much and do things, that you are also experiencing still the joy of the Lord. And we're just glad that you're with us. As you can see, we're still in our prayer room upstairs and and our Christmas lily or whatever we want to call it, the Christmas flower, is just exploding with flowers on the Christmas day. I think it has, uh, what, four big flowers that came out, three of them, and I think came out today. And so this the clock on this one is pretty good because it's Christmas Day and it's a Christmas flower. And we're just enjoying all these wonderful plants. But thank you for joining us and being part of this Christmas Day. And, and uh, as we go in and look at the whole area of Luke's, the rest of the story, Tonight, we're going to look at Jesus himself, because not only did all these other have people have testimonies about what was going on with the baby Jesus, well, we also got to look at things through the eyes of Jesus, who is looking out at all the people that are looking at him. I, I don't know what it's like to be a baby, and I guess we, we forget that because we don't have memories back to that early. But I, I know when you've got brand new grandchildren or brand new kids, the first thing everybody does is look and stare at you. And the baby, after a period of time, looks and stares back at you. And so I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting just to review what everybody was seeing as they looked at the baby Jesus, the Son of God, in the manger, and how the Son of God was digesting and taking all this information and looking back at all these people. So as we said, the rest of the story today focuses on Jesus. And again, remember, Luke is giving a true account to Theopolis. He is writing down, gathering up the information, almost like a, a person who is trying to write a book and gathers all the facts and everything. And then he put it all down in a letter and he prepared it. And he wanted to make sure it was factual so that he could send it on to Theopolis and that it would be a blessing to him. So we've already talked. If we were to look at our timeline over the last eight days, we got before the birth of Christ. We've got, of course, Zacharias. We got Elizabeth. We got Mary and Joseph before the birth of Christ. Then after the birth of Christ, then we have the shepherds. Uh, Simeon and Anna. So we've got quite a bit going on here between before and after on the timeline. And Luke is writing about all this so that we can get a better understanding who this Jesus is. Of course, we should start by looking at Jesus from the whole area of his conception. And then as we move along, you know, we don't have any written testimony of what Jesus thought or said during those times, but I think what was being said and thought about was being put in the minds of the people who were filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking what they saw about the child. And I know that that information that they spoke was also true because we see it being fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ as he begins his ministry. And so the first thing that we want to take a look at Again, just to remind ourselves on the journey, because we know that Mary herself in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 35, she is a virgin, and she's 
going to conceive a son, and the son was going to be named Jesus. And I think it's interesting because here, the son of the father, that seed, as it were, is being implanted in Mary so that a child could be uh, grow and mature and come forth like every man and woman here on earth. That there was, that he would know that the child, the Son of God, would experience every detail of what man and woman go through. And that's what we find out from scriptures because he became like us. And that's why I think it's so important to remember not only is he the Son of God, but he is also the Son of Man. And that, that phrase goes back and forth throughout the New Testament. And so, again, just to review, we know that Jesus was born of a virgin. And that's so important because it, it needs to be a, a miracle child. And a lot of times people don't want to believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. But it's part and a significant part of the gospel, of the good news that a woman would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. And that's what made Jesus Christ uniquely different than all mankind. So, And when he was conceived, of course, the angels said to him, to Mary, that you need to call him Jesus. And we've discussed this many times, but the word Jesus also means Savior or to save. And I like that because he has come to save us from our sins. He's also, we are told, that he is going to be the son of the Most High. You know, the Most High they knew, the Jesus people, Jesus, or Jewish people knew that the son of the Most High was God who had his own child. And there is no higher than that. He is God of God and he is King of Kings. That's who Jesus is. And Mary was told that he would come out of the throne of David, out of the line of David, that genealogy that was being passed on. And that all this was going to take place because of what the Holy Spirit was going to do in Mary's life. And it's interesting that the Holy Spirit, the angel again says, you shall conceive by the Holy Spirit. And not only is he going to be named Jesus, and he's going to be of the line of David, but you also need to remember that he was going to be called the Son of God. So this is the very foundation. And the thing that I think we should, we should catch here, a lot of times in our world that we think that a fetus is not a baby. And a fetus is just uh, a living tissue until it's born. If you read the book of Luke at all, and you read about this account, not only of him, but John the Baptist, you would know that that living embryo grows within the womb and becomes and is a full-fledged person. And we see that because why? Because the angel said that the one that is within your womb, that is going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit, is going to, his name will be Jesus. He is going to be the Son of the Most High, and he is the Son of God. He is all that already before he even comes out of the womb. Isn't that an amazing miracle? That's an amazing thing that God has, was doing and was sending forth. That's why the angels were celebrating when they were gathered together with the shepherds, because they knew that this was something unique and special. And as we said over the last number of nights, the various people that have been involved have marveled, had marveled about what God was doing. So the first important part is that Jesus was born of a virgin. Then as we move on into chapter 2 of Luke, we then get more description about where Jesus' birth is going to be. So he is uniquely born of a virgin, which was foretold by prophecy. Then by prophecy in the Old Testament, it was foretold even where he would be born. The area, what he would be part of. And that's an amazing thing. Because 
again, the miracle had to take place for Jesus that when uh, Mary got impregnated, she was in a different community. And to fulfill a scripture, they were going to have to get from where they were to where God wanted them to be so that they would be able to fulfill the scripture. They didn't realize that they were fulfilling scripture, probably. You know, they weren't having the Old Testament scrolls in front of them saying, okay, it's got to be a virgin. Yeah, okay, it's got to be, you know, a born in, in Bethlehem in a manger and all these deep. No, they didn't know those details. Only the Holy Spirit and the angels of God knew those details. And that's why it's such a miraculous birth. Because when the child is born, they, the child becomes born in Bethlehem. And I need to tell you that from Nazareth to Bethlehem, that's a 65-mile journey. And because of Caesar Augustus, who is in Rome. Now think about the details. You know, uh, a lot of times me and Colwyn, when things be happen, happen to us, we look at all the finite details that God puts in to make something happen. How God brings something together that it's impossible for you to pull it together. We have shared testimony over the last little while about David's song. That is a God thing. That is, that's why we're calling it the miracle of David's song. Because God pulls out from all over the world little pieces to bring it back together at the right time. So that it would fulfill exactly what it is he wants done. And this is what's happening. He has to move on Caesar Augustus and say, Caesar Augustus, I'm going to move on you and you need to take a census. And you need to say that as people take the census, that they all got to go back to their hometowns. And of course, Joseph, he's in Nazareth. He's got to go back to Bethlehem because he's of the genealogy of David. Bethlehem is the city of bread and also the city of kings. And so at that exact moment, he has to go back and fulfill his obligation when it comes to this idea of giving forth his name and Mary's name. We talked about that the other day because she's been betrothed. That was already legally binding. So he would register her name and his name. And that's where, of course, the baby is going to also be registered, that if there's another census down the road, Jesus would have to go back there again too, because that's part of his genealogy. That's part of his lineage, is the city of Bethlehem, so that they could be uh, registered. And the unique part about this is that because they're sent back, and because, you know, they probably don't get there in time, and it's kind of the last moment, you know, they're probably thinking, you know, maybe Mary's going to have her baby soon. Maybe we should wait in Nazareth and, you know, and all these kinds of things. And then finally they said, okay, let's go. And so they had to arrange a donkey and and uh, probably people to help so that she and the baby Jesus could could get to make the journey. And, of course, when they get to um, Bethlehem, only place that's left over for them to stay is the stable. And, of course, we know the stable is where all the other animals are, that they're brought in at nighttime. Wouldn't be very nice smell and everything. And then that there was a manger. And the manger is, the, is the, the trough, as you were, that the farmers would feed their animals in, put straw on that in. And that would become where, you know, baby Jesus would be laid. Mary, probably just somewhere over on the hayloft or over on the hay, you know, just began to be, you know, get the pains of childbirth and give forth the child. And as the child is being born, there probably was a nursemaid that came along with Mary. They're in the Asian culture. There's usually someone around to help and they would take the child and do what needs to be done after the birth and clean it all up and then wrap it in swaddling clothes and laid it into a manger and give the mother a few minutes just to relax and to to compose herself again. And so now the baby ends up in a manger. And of course, you know, that's when the shepherds are told that, okay, something unique is going on here. There is a birth of a child. And this child is unique because it is a savior. These are the names that are given to, to uh, the shepherds. It is, he will be a savior. He is Emmanuel, which is God with us. He will be the Jesus who saves us from our sins. He is the Christ who is the anointed one, 
that comes to anoint his people. And he is the Son of God. So all these things are beginning to pile up, not only on Mary and Joseph, and that's why they were continuing to marvel through all this Jesus, all this birth of Jesus, but all these things are proclaiming who Jesus is. And they not only are prophetically given, but it turns out that they will be also fulfilled in the life of Christ. And that's the amazing part. But then as we move from her conception, from Jesus' conception, when he was, you know, conceived by the Holy Spirit, then how he had to be born in Bethlehem because of the census. That's another miracle that takes place in the shepherds. Then it was interesting that we see that in verse 21 of chapter 2, after eight days, Jesus needs to be circumcised. And the thing I, I, if there's things that you can love or not love, is I, I love how Jesus fulfills the scriptures and not only fulfills, but he is in obedience to the law, to the law of Moses. And it was the law of Moses that states that after the eighth day, especially a, a boy that, that opens the womb for the first time, must be circumcised. That was the law. And so after eight days, they were circumcised, which was to fulfill the law. And I, I want you to know, and people don't always get it, Jesus came to fulfill the law in all details. That's why the Pharisees and the Sadducees couldn't get him. That's why the scribes and the rulers, they were trying to find things for him that he had broken the law. And Jesus did not break the law. Right from his very birth, he was obedient to the law, obedient to the senses, obedient to the law, and was able to come back. And after eight days, he would be circumcised. And as we said, on the eighth day, he would be also given a name. There would be a naming ceremony. As I've told you, we've had, we still have naming ceremonies. And a name is so important. You know, don't underestimate if you still, if you're a young mother and father and you're about to have children, really pray about the name that you should give your children and that they would be able to carry it out. And so they were told, the angel told Mary and Joseph, or specifically Mary, you name the child Jesus. Why? Because he will be the savior from our sins. So right after eight days, okay, so the, you got the, the, the miracle of the virgin birth. We've got the miracle of, of uh, coming to the city of Bethlehem and being born. Now we have the, the miracle where he's fulfilling the law already. At eight days, he's fulfilling the law right from when he was born. He's fulfilling the law, and we know that his name will be Jesus, the Savior, the one who would save us from our sins. But then there is something else that takes place. And, and again, we don't always understand the, the clock, the, the timelines. So we got from the birth. Now we move to the circumcision. And then 40 days later, they have to come back to the temple to present the child. They need to present the firstborn in Leviticus chapter 12 and in Exodus chapter 13, 12 to 15. It talks about the firstborn and how the redemption of the firstborn needs to be brought before the Lord. And so here, all knew that they had to come because of the, the, this idea of redemption. They had to come back 40 days later and present the child to God. And it's at that point, 40 days later, that we meet um, Simeon, and a few moments later, we meet Anna. So it wasn't right at the manger scene, it wasn't right at the circumcision, but it was 40 days later. And again, the names keep piling up. Remember we said that the shepherds and Jesus and Mary knew that it would he would be a savior, Emmanuel, Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. But then as we get into Simeon, we then get more names where he is a consolation or comforter. Again, he would be the salvation or savior of the world. 
and he would be one who would light, be a light unto the people. And again, many of these things he proved and, and lived out to be. And that's why they, I think not only are these names names that describe who he is, but they're also prophetic names about the kind of ministry that he would give to the people and still gives to this day. Is Jesus still a savior of this day? Is Jesus still amongst us and with us? Is he still the Christ, the anointed one? Is he still the son of God today? Is he a comforter? Does he bring light? And the answer would be, yes, he does all of that. And of course, um, Simeon also then told the parents, uh, and Jesus would have been there, of course, as a child, because remember, Simeon is holding the baby when he's speaking all these different kinds of things about Jesus. And then he points to and begins to speak to the mother and say, Mom and Dad, this child is going to be the fall. It's going to be the rise and fall of many. Of course, we talked about how Jesus would become not only the chief cornerstone, but also the stumbling block. And to this day, he is. There is people that will receive Jesus, and because they receive Jesus, Jesus becomes the chief cornerstone. But if you're like the builders and reject Jesus Christ as a chief cornerstone, and lots of people reject Jesus as a chief cornerstone, then he becomes a stumbling block, and people stumble over him. People fall down because they just won't get lined up with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So again, here, it's still happening today. People are choosing not to line up with Jesus. And because of that, they stumble over him. But there's others who choose to line up with Jesus, and he becomes their cornerstone. Where everything in their life begins to line up and make sense. Because the Father is fulfilling his will through the Son into our lives. Amen? And he said that he would be a sign, both to who? The Jews and to the Gentiles. Has he stopped being a sign? Has Jesus stopped being a sign today? And the answer is no, he's still a sign. If we look to him, he is a sign of showing who he is as redemption, but he is also a sign as like a street sign pointing to the Father, because as we shared this morning, you know, when you look under Jesus and you see Jesus, if you look at Jesus, you'll see the Father. And if you see the Father, you see Jesus, because the two of them are one. And so he was going to be signed. And then at the same time, as we know, just after that, and I mean, Mary and, and Joseph are probably sitting back and say, wow, this is amazing. Anna shows up. And remember, she's that 84-year-old widow, and she comes on the scene, and she begins to speak, and now she also prophesies and gives some more names and some more understanding and, and talks about who Jesus is. And, and Jesus is the salvation for the Jews and the Gentiles. He is going to bring about redemption to the city of Jerusalem. And we talked about that yesterday, how there is not only redemption for the city of Jerusalem, both in the time of then, also in years later, and also futuristic into the book of Revelation itself. Even in the last days, Jesus is coming back to redeem and to bring back his lost. He is coming with the rewards in his hands, and he is going to come for his church, and he is going to set up his kingdom, and his throne will be in the city of Jerusalem. All of these things are happening, and he's only 40 days old at this point. But then we see that as we move on into verses 39 to 40, then the family, then after all this takes place, and as they're marveling and thinking about this, the Bible says that Mary treasured these things in her heart because she just, you know, I think she needed some encouragement. She needed to know, is this really the Son of God? And every time when these things are happening, it says that she treasured these things in her heart. Well, from verse 39 to 40, the family performs all the things according to the law, and then they begin to go back home. And to go from Nazareth back to Galilee is about 90 miles. 
So however they were going back, it was going to be a long journey back. And the Bible says in verses 39 to 40 that Jesus began to grow strong in the spirit. And he was filled with wisdom and he was filled with the grace of God. I love that because it doesn't just say that he had wisdom of his own, but the, the, he, he, we are told that he has the wisdom of God. That's why I think when we go over into James and James, you know, it says to us that we lack wisdom. Let us ask of the Father. Let us ask of God and he will give it to us generously. He generously gave the wisdom of the throne into the Son of Man and the Son of God. He gave him wisdom. But not only that, I think there's something very unique. He filled them. He filled his son with the grace of God. I don't know if when you take time to look at the life of Jesus Christ and all that went on with him and how he was persecuted and hounded and harassed and how they wanted to kill him and everything else, even from when he was born, we know that they tried to kill, you know, Jesus himself. The rulers wanted to kill him. You know, Herod wanted to kill him. All these were taking place. And the thing is, but God, this was God's son. And upon God's son was God's grace. And I saw and see the grace of God. Matter of fact, in my notes, I underlined it, that he was filled with the grace of God. You know, if there's anything that we need to have in our land nowadays, in the hearts of the disciples, remember, we are to be followers of Jesus. And we're to be Christ-like, which means that we are taking on his nature and his character. We are dying to ourselves and living for him. And wouldn't it be nice that as we are praying for the filling of the Holy Spirit daily, that we would also be praying to be filled with the grace of God. If there's anything that we need today in this world is the grace of God. His grace, righteousness. We're able to do, we're able to have everything that goes on around about us is because of the grace of God. Can you say amen to that? Because that's what it's all about. It's the grace of God. You say, well, you don't know what's going on around me. Yes, I know it's a challenge. I've had death in my family. I've had all kinds of things. My stepmother died this year. You know, friends have passed away. Cohen's had relatives that have passed away. Yes, the valley has been deep. But I have also found that the grace of God, where it's in that idea that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. What is greater? The grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God is greater in us than that of the world. And that's where we build our tent. <laughs> that's where we live. Amen. Can you accept that today? That's the grace of God. Then as we, we're, we're going to move on just a little bit further, not only talk about just how the baby Jesus and then how Jesus fulfilled the law and how that at 40 days he came back and then as he continued to grow as a child that he had the Spirit of God upon him and that he was full of wisdom and grace, but that we can also move on just for a few moments to see, because a lot of times we don't talk about this. We, this section of Scripture sort of gets lost. Because it's not talked about in any uh, majorly in any of the other Gospels. But Luke goes on and begins to talk about a little bit about the younger years of Jesus. And it says to us in verses 41 to 52, and I like this. I like it very much because it says, And the parents went every year to Passover. We can see that the parents have a love for the Word of God. Have a love to be obedient. Have a love and a joy to want to be righteous. And that's how they were bringing up their, their son. You mm -hmm. say, well, it's the son of God. They wouldn't have to bring him up. He does. No, God, you know, has birthed forth his son to come under. And we see a little bit later, Jesus talks that he comes under the authority of his parents. Until he became of the proper age to be able to go forth. And so we see here that not only did they come down every year, but when see when Jesus... It talks about uh, that when he was around 12, he would come down again at Passover time. And that's when they may have done there or back at home. I'm not sure which because it didn't say. But at age 12, there's the Bat Mitzvah. 
And that is a time, and we don't have that as much anymore. But see, we we in our culture, for many of us, we have, you know, the child, and then we have the teenager, and then we have the adult. They didn't do that. They went from the child to the adult. Can you imagine that? That at age 12, you were then considered to be responsible for your own life, for your own decisions at age 12. So at age 12, he would have had the bar mitzvah. He would have learned about all the Old Testament scriptures and everything. And there would have been a small little party where he would have come out at age 12 and be considered now a young man or a Jewish adult. And now that he would be responsible for his actions. And maybe that's why, because after his age 12 and his bar mitzvah, his parents were down uh, visiting, fulfilling the Passover. And they go back three days journey. And they happen to notice that Jesus wasn't there. I, I'm not sure how you can go three days and not notice where your son is. But I guess that's possible. And they didn't know. And so then they headed back. And of course... They eventually find Jesus, and where is he? He's sitting down, the Bible says, with the teachers and rulers, having a discussion with them and speaking great wisdom beyond his years. And to me, that's so interesting. And so some of us say, oh, he's being rebellious. You know, he didn't go home with his parents. But according to Jewish tradition, he was already in adulthood. And so he was speaking, but he then goes back. And the parents, they find him with the teacher and that he was sharing what he was. He said, you know, the parents said, well, what are you doing? He says, don't you know, I need to be about my father's business. <laughs> Can you think about that? I know some of us, would, you know, those who watch that you're, you work a lot with children's ministry or work with children. Think about this. This is a person at age 12 who now has to be responsible, and not only at age 12, tells the people, tells his parents, I need to be about doing about my father's business. And that's what's that? Proclaiming to people about the redemptive work of God, about the Messiah, about probably a lot of Old Testament teaching. And he was doing that with these teachers. The Bible says teachers, and teachers was another name for rabbi, religious people. People that would be in the synagogues and discussing and, and talking and debating all kinds of things. And he was fitting right in the midst of them. And it finally says in verse 52 that Jesus continued to increase in wisdom and stature. So as we look at this testimony from Luke, Concerning the rest of the story, we have a unique picture of who Jesus is by his life. His life has become the testimony. His life is a testimony of the virgin birth. His life is a testimony of how he was born in a manger in Bethlehem. His life is a testimony how he fulfilled the law of circumcision. His life is a testimony how at 40 days he would go back and be dedicated and how his life was prophesied about by Simeon and Anna. His life was a testimony that how his family, how he came from a godly family and how his family loved God and served God and continued to come and to be able to worship God during the Passover and his life was a testimony of the Spirit of God, of the wisdom of God, and of the grace of God. All this was beginning to happen. All the seeds of this was beginning to be put in right from the very birth. And as he goes into his young adulthood, from when he moves from a child into the area of an adult, as a young Jewish adult, this wisdom and knowledge and grace and spirit of God continue to flow in him and flow through him. And I believe we should be expecting that of the people that we see and walk with too. That God would begin to work in us, give us wisdom, give us knowledge, 
that we would continue to grow in the strength of our Lord Jesus Christ every day. That's why he came. His life is a testimony and example to us. What we too, who are Christ-like or Christians, should be like. Amen. So as we've celebrated today the birth of Jesus Christ, remember that it was just the opening of the door. It was the beginning of the foundation that God was laying before, right at the very beginning when the child would be conceived, was laying the foundation of what our Savior, our Messiah would be throughout this whole time here on earth. And not only that, it continued to give prophetic ideas and words and meaning to the things of yet when he comes back again. This is the amazing story. This is the story of Luke, the inside story. And I pray today that as we have gathered together in faith with our, each other to believe and, and to think about and to meditate on who Jesus is, that we would be richly encouraged, richly built up, built up in wisdom, built up in love, and most of all, built up in God's grace. Because when we look into the manger and we see the face of Jesus, remember, that was also the face of God. And the fullness and the character and all who God is was in that child. And that child became the example for us where Jesus said, leave all and follow me. I pray today that as you've gone through this Christmas week and as you've gone through this Christmas day, that you will say deep in your heart, oh Lord, here am I. I desire with all my spirit, soul, and body to follow you. Amen. I pray that that will be our commitment. And I pray that as we've looked at the baby Jesus this week from all of these others' testimonies, that we have come to a place of seeing him a whole lot different than we have seen him in the past. And that we too may shout and praise and give glory to God our Father. For we serve a living God who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to study over these last eight days all the different inside stories of who Jesus is. And we can learn more about you, Jesus. And not only learn more about you, but we can learn prophetically who you are and what you would be doing, and what you will continue to do for generations and generations that have come after the time you were here on earth. And I thank you for that. And I pray, O oh God, for everyone who has gathered together tonight, that you would continue to fill them with much wisdom and with much grace and with the fullness of your love. And Lord, that each time that as we look out, not only into your word, but into your face, we will truly see you as the Son of God. So, Father, we place ourselves in your hands and give you thanks for this day now. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us over these last eight nights. We won't be here tomorrow night, but we will be back. Again. We still continue to teach in the morning. And so join us at eight o'clock in the morning as we're continuing to study the word believe. We're going to go into the book of Acts. And we're going to pray that our, our believing uh, will continue to grow stronger in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We love you on. Love you all. Keep on keeping on for Jesus. And Lord willing, we'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye now.